Hello everybody and welcome to TriDoc episode 86. This week's questions are taken from the 5 minute guide to the USS John R. Craig and a whole medley of 5 minute guides revoiced that were uploaded in the same week. Luke Dogwalker asks, Battleship designs post World War I don't seem to feature a main mast as seen in the early Dreadnought era, i.e. tripod masts or lattice masts. Sometimes the main mast seems to have been replaced with a tower, like in the South Dakota and Iowa. Alternatively, the mast has disappeared inside a block of superstructure such as Refit Warspite Vanguard or the King George V's. But what's going on inside these structures? Does the old tripod mast still exist inside as a way of ensuring the main tops with their gunnery directors and radar aren't shot away, or is there a different method used to support the main tops against being in danger of collapse from incoming fire? It depends somewhat on what ship you're looking at, because certain ships had more mast left than others, albeit they didn't have the massive for uh, masts that the World War One and pre-World War One ships did. Uh, you can see here this picture looking at the reverse side of HMS Warspite, for example, there is still a reasonably substantial mast structure coming out of the back of the tower structure there but in some part this is because it's a refit and in some part because of what it's designed to support so on some post world war one designs this sort of mass structure or whatever form it might take was effectively there to support radio antenna and that was about it uh, whereas the heavy fire control systems etc would would go on the tower now that obviously depending on which design philosophy you'd followed, could stand you in good or bad set when it came to putting things like radar, which also needed high-mounted antenna arrays um, to be installed. But nevertheless, in the sort of whole cloth designs, so look, North Carolina, South Dakota, King George V, etc., what tended to happen is that the masts, if any, would be relatively lightweight and, as I said, would mainly be there to support... Um, communications arrays in the later designs such as Iowa and Vanguard they knew that they were going to have to support radar and so you had sort of a reintroduction of a relatively solid mass structure in order to support the relevant antennas um, but the fire control systems by and large they were kind of supported separate to the tower now what you had was an armoured tube and it wasn't ridiculously heavily armored because well putting that much armor high up would be really difficult um in, in terms of weight and stability but it was weight it was rated against splinter protection and passing damage and this armored tube ran from the base of the fire control systems up top all the way down usually to below the main armor deck level where its contents, which would be the cabling that would transmit the various uh, signals from the fire control systems, would then be distributed to the appropriate locations. So the fire control systems rested atop this tube, which, was, as we say, was supported through and down, through down and through the the main armor deck. So it was it was kind of in some ways like a like a mass structure. It certainly couldn't have freely supported itself because it didn't have the extra bracing that a tripod or lattice mast would have. Um, it did depend to a fairly substantial degree for remaining upright on the tower of the bridge around it. But significant parts of that bridge tower could be knocked out, but set on fire, etc. And that armoured column would still be in place, supporting the fire control system relatively smoothly. Now, where you have refitted ships that have been refitted with a tower superstructure like the Warspite, that rear mast section there you can see sticking up, that does actually continue down through the, the tower bridge structure all the way down again to the main armor deck. Um, and although it is a more substantial in terms of volume uh, structure as compared to the, uh, the armored channel or tube, whatever you want to call it, that on the newer designs and again it's not really capable of entirely self-supporting it is 
in a much better position to do so than um, just the armor tube on its own because effectively it's a remnant of, of a, almost a remnant of a tripod mask just without the tripod part so it's a monopod mask um, but yes that, that structure is still present inside the tower so I hope that gives a little bit more insight. ST Rub asks when did the US and British fleets shift from guard ships to guard helicopters? Well by this I'm presuming you mean plane guards for the aircraft carrier operations um, if you mean guard ships as a more general thing out in the uh, ocean, then please let me know and I'll uh, further answer the question in that, that regard. But as far as plane guards are concerned, they haven't completely shifted away from guard ships, but by and large, the shift from always having a guard ship to having guard helicopter or helicopters to support aircraft carrier operations came about in the mid to late 1950s as helicopters themselves became more and more common. And this was simply because it was very risky trying to have a plane guard as a ship in place during flight operations because it effectively what you're they're there for, uh, as you probably know, is to rescue pilots from aircraft that have ditched near the carrier, usually overshoots from uh, failed landings or perhaps a failed takeoff. Now this puts you in a bit of a quandary because ships still take some time to manoeuvre, so you want to be as close to the possible site of the accident as you can. But if you get too close, A, you risk being hit by the very aircraft that you're trying to save, and B, you also risk being run down by the carrier that you're trying to uh, look after. The HMAS Melbourne being quite the famous example for that. And the solution, obviously, would then be to position yourself so, uh, sort of a slightly on a slightly different course, off to the left or to the right from the carrier, and thus you avoid the aircraft and being run down. The problem with that is, of course, that if the um, if an aircraft does go over in ditch, unless the carrier takes rapid evasive action you may very well not get there before the airplane and pilot get run over. And even if the carrier does take action, it's still going to take you quite the while to get there to rescue them. And they may not have that long. The beauty of a helicopter is, of course, as long as the helicopter's flying at any kind of reasonable altitude, it's basically impossible for the aircraft carrier to run it down outside of some very weird circumstances. And the helicopter can afford to be just off the center of the flight line. Because if an aircraft goes down, it can be there and hovering over it almost before the splashing has cleared. And so, therefore, helicopters have a rather inherent obvious advantage in conducting plane guard duties. However, just because they have inherent advantages doesn't mean they always have those advantages. And so although the majority of daytime flight operations would use guard helicopters, let's say from the mid to late 50s, uh, dash early 60s onwards, the uh, role of plane guarding by a ship was still very much in place for operations such as, say, night operations, where a lot of helicopters, even up until relatively recently, lacked the proper equipment to fly safely at night and conduct rescue ops at night. Um, You've also got very stormy high weather conditions where the helicopter may not be safe to operate or the seas may be too rough to affect a uh, rope, uh, rope borne recovery system, whereas a ship, while it still might be dangerous, is somewhat more durable in those circumstances. And that's pretty much still how it is today. There are some more guard operations done at night using helicopters, although I, as far as I can understand, ships are still preferred. Um, but I still think a plane guard ship is going to be there for a number of circumstances, including things like rough weather, for quite some time to come. Doug Gallagher asks, should Germany in World War II have kept up with the Type 7 subs or pushed development of the Type 9s or even the Type 21s to meet closer to what would have been akin to the G Gato or Gato class submarines, i.e. US late war submarine strategy of fleet subs versus German strategy? I think the German submarine strategy of keeping up with the Type 7s was probably sound, and I don't think pushing more Type 9s or even pushing for early adoption of Type 21s at the expense of the Type 7s would have done them too many favours. 
at least in realistic timelines. Now, the reason I say that is because compared to the US submarine situation, the Germans faced a very different uh, problem. German submarines did not have to go anywhere near as far as American submarines to find targets, which meant that the sort of the long range, large torpedo complement of the American fleet subs was not necessarily vital to most of the German sub operations, although the Type 9s obviously did carry similar levels of torpedoes and did find some good use for them. Now, the other factor is the anti submarine warfare of the opposite side. Large submarines, generally speaking, take longer to dive, are slightly harder to manoeuvre, and therefore are more vulnerable to incoming escorts as opposed to smaller subs, which are quicker to dive and more agile. Now, when you're facing off against what have accounted for Japanese anti-submarine warfare efforts, normally... Having a large submarine with a slightly slower dive time was not a particularly massive problem. Albeit that, with that said, the Americans did make specific improvements to their fleet submarines, both uh, the well, the Gatos, the Belaos, Belaos, whatever, and the Tenches, etc., in order to accelerate their dive time, specifically because of the risk of being attacked by escorts. Now. The Type 7, as I say, being a smaller submarine, therefore could inherently dive and manoeuvre a little bit quicker. And when you're facing off against British, and in fact, and indeed as well, American anti-submarine warfare efforts with sonar and all sorts of novel depth charge projectors, those few extra seconds could be the matter of life or death. And so if I was placed in a situation where I had to try and uh, fight a convoy that had escorts in a submarine... I'd probably actually prefer taking something like a Type 7 over something like a Type 9 because it allows me to respond more rapidly to the situation in question. And so this this combination of shorter range and more intense escort activity, thus a greater emphasis on being able to get out of the way very quickly, plus the fact that because of those escorts you are only likely to get a few attacks in before you had to go off looking for other prey, as opposed to um, a lot of American fleet subs which were able to attack a convoy, dive and withdraw, then come back and keep coming back and keep coming back because there were so few escorts they were pulled from pillar to post trying to rescue survivors or going off on wild goose chases. It kind of means that, again, that, that large torpedo load may not service them quite as well. And obviously the time penalties for coming back if you've expended your, all your torpedoes, although they still exist, are still substantially less, generally speaking, for a Atlantic operating U-boat as opposed to a Pacific operating American fleet submarine. And so because of those different operational parameters, I think both submarine arms did near enough the best that they could with the design choices when it came to choosing which particular submarines to build. Sergeant Spiffy Wiffy asks, was any thought given to using water jets or other forms of encased impellers on larger ships? So yes, but not in the time period that this channel normally covers for the reason that actually workable large scale water jet or pump jet technology was not really a thing until post 1950, actually in that back in the late 1950s is when you start to see the first properly working commercially viable units. Now, there are a number of advantages and disadvantages when it comes to warships for using these kinds of devices. You can obviously direct the jets, which makes your ship theoretically more agile. They are quieter, which gives you increased stealth. Um, but on the other hand, as you can see, they are vastly more complicated than a traditional propeller shaft arrangement, which does make things a little bit interesting when you're trying to uh, fix, maintain and prevent damage to the technology in question while you're at sea. Um, you can get higher speeds out of them, which is a good thing, and you are also more efficient than propellers at higher speeds because cavitation is delayed and that's because cavitation is uh, 
reduced when water pressure is increased. This is why submarines like to go deep because then they can run up to higher speeds without inducing cavitation and that's a whole other field of discussion for another time. But anyway, basically because the pressure inside the pump jet is relatively high for the water, um, cavitation is reduced which makes it more efficient, but that only works at high speeds above about 30 to 32 knots and since the vast majority of ships even the ones that are capable of more than 30 knots that were built in the post-World War II environment generally speed, spend most of their time at less than 30 knots. It's just not worth it. The only places where it is worth it to use uh, pump jets on vessels of any substantial displacement is where the secondary benefits of things like primarily stealth are paramount and in most cases you have a nuclear power plant to offset the inefficiencies and this is why pump jets start to appear on things like um, submarines say the Trafalgar class and such in the 1970s and 80s and gradually spread so now the Seawolves, the Virginias, the aforementioned Trafalgars, the Astutes and some of the French and Russian submarines also use pump jets because that stealth advantage is really really important for a submarine for fairly obvious reasons now a few surface warships do use them as well but on very large ships the propeller is still really king and probably will be for quite a while at least in uh, warship terms largely because of the technically complex nature of things Command Man 7 asks, It always seems that most World War II era ships are scrapped at the tail end of the 1950s. Why is this so? Was there any political action that led to this, or was it a mere coincidence? There were a whole combination of factors that saw a lot of ships getting scrapped at the end of the 1950s and the early start of the early 1960s. I'll try to enumerate the major ones. So one of the single biggest issues was the needs, need for refits. Now during the interwar period their ships had been kept around a lot lot longer because treaty restrictions had limited the potential outgrowth of their successors which left older ships as still viable combat units plus costs involved etc meant that it was worth keeping them around because the treaty also meant that they couldn't the that anything you built else couldn't get that much bigger so in the post-war environment there were no such treaties and so ship technology had continued to grow apace this meant that when ships came up to around about the 20 year mark which is usually when they need some serious refills and or modernization and usually complete engine overhauls and things like that which are very expensive operations then all of a sudden they're not really worth refitting because you look at where naval technology had advanced to at that point you'd basically have to tear the old ship apart completely rebuild it to keep it up to date as well as all the other expensive work like replacing uh, parts of your engine and power plant so compared to just getting rid of it and using the scrap money to help pay for a new, brand new all singing all dancing warship it made more sense to do that basic ships were wearing out related to that is the advance of technology the simple fact that okay fair enough in the 1950s the a refitted world war ii ship could still have a pretty decent role in frontline operations but by the late 50s early 60s when you're looking at carriers carrier aircraft got much bigger much heavier and much faster missiles and guided bombs and such like are becoming more and more prevalent and so counter missiles and surface to air missile defenses are, ne are necessary which the older ships don't have um, there's a lot more helicopter operations which again are demanding larger ships and so on and so on and so on so again with all this brand new tech it makes more sense to a build from new and b build bigger because the surviving pre-war world war ii ships had been built to treaty limits that assumed certain things about what your primary weapons were going to be size of aircraft etc and those assumptions were no longer anywhere near valid um then there's economics 
the f- there was a huge pause in most forms of shipbuilding after the Second World War because, hey, you had plenty of ships to go around. You could get rid of a bunch of the oldest and most worn out and still have a massive fleet relative to what you started out with uh, if, at the beginning of the war, unless, of course, you've been on the losing side. Um, and so it it just wasn't worth building anything new for a while. Um, but then once everyone got their head around, okay, we've probably saved enough money for, through not building ships now, but technology has advanced. We need to build new ships. What can we build? Okay, we're going to build bigger, faster, stronger, etc. So all these new ships started eventually to be churned out, and then all of a sudden the older ships are surplus to requirements. Then finally, there's the good old politics and the late 50s, early 60s are remembered with a fair degree of loathing by all sorts of uh, military veterans and not a few civilian enthusiasts because that saw, say, in the UK, various defence white papers and in other places as well, various defence reviews, technical reviews, etc. that all seemed to suggest that the era of big technology units such as uh, ships was over and that everything was now going to be small compact missiles etc etc like i think like just almost just the missiles now where have we heard all this before and the politicians bought it and so a lot of future projects were cancelled older ships weren't approved for refits and repairs and as their technological capabilities that further and further behind what was possible with the later designs again they just weren't worth keeping around the final factor is the soviets in as much as large numbers of world war ii era ships such as say a lot of the king george v class etc were kept in reserve because it was feared that the soviet navy was going to try and build a gargantuan surface fleet to challenge nato and certainly with the uh proliferation of things like the Sverdlov class cruisers that did initially appear to be the case but by the latter part of the 1950s it was a very clear that that wasn't quite in fact the case largely thanks to uh, one certain mustachio georgian keeling over but also with the cold war running as it was it was pretty clear that the ussr's main focus was land and air with the sea a distant third whereas the US Navy in particular, and also to uh, various degrees, the Royal Navy and French Navy, as much as they could survive the politicians, were still looking very much at maritime power. And so with those navies, theoretically at least, exerting a significant dominance over the Soviet Navy, a whole ton of older ships that have been kept in reserve purely to bring back just in case, were then now surplus to requirements because they weren't as afraid of the Soviet Navy as they had been in, say, 1949. And so off to the breakers went a lot of the reserve ships that had been kept to fight a threat that they now believed hadn't actually been there in the first place. Macca17 asks, If you were able to arrange for HMS Hood to have her much-needed refit, but in so doing, Hood takes the place of another ship that had a pre-war refit, which ship would you choose to lose her refit? So, of the refitted pre-war ships, you definitely don't want to take the refit away from HMS Warspite because, well, one, Warspite, and two, she went through a fair number of actions where that refit came in very handy. Then you've got HMS Renown, and again, HMS Renown went through a large variety of actions where the fact that she was refitted came in very handy, so definitely still keep her. And that leaves the fully refitted ships which we could substitute hood in for as the queen elizabeth and valiant of the two there's not tremendous amount to choose from as they tended to operate together quite a bit but if i was forced to choose between the two for refit purposes i would probably choose to drop a valiant's refit because due to a spectacular series of bad luck incidents valiant by the mid to late part of the war was substantially less useful than 
the Queen Elizabeth in large part due to a late later in the war issue with being incorrectly propped and then dropped in a dry dock, which was not a good thing. Um, so yeah, using that foresight, or I guess for uh, the uh, hindsight of uh, future knowledge, I would replace Valiant Stay in the dry dock with Hood and get Hood refitted up to full spec. David Knowles asks, how would Bismarck have fared in its final battle if it had been fitted with the all-or-nothing armour scheme rather than the turtleback? Well, it's not strictly the turtleback that makes Bismarck a not all-or-nothing scheme. It's more the distributed armour elsewhere, sort of bow plating, stern plating, upper belt plating, etc., etc. There are examples, albeit um, in the minority, of ships with an all-or-nothing armour scheme and some form of turtleback armour. But I get the spirit of your question, which is effectively an all-or-nothing Bismarck. Um, now, there are a few scenarios. You basically have to do a two-by-two two grid. You end up with four possible variants of Bismarck in this scenario. One is whether you go with a turtleback or you go with the more conventional for all-or-nothing battleships, uh, single-thickness main deck, perhaps with a, a small bomb initiator deck above. So those are two options. And then those have to be cross-correlated with two other options, which is that if you're going to go with all-or-nothing armour, are you going to try and further distribute the main belt thickness, i.e. take off all the uh, side plating that's not main belt thickness and then just expand the main belt at that thickness until you reach the same displacement or are you going to try and again remove all that extraneous non-belt thickness uh, plating and then expand the main belt thickness as it is in place which would probably work a lot better with a turtle back deck so that the belt becomes a lot thicker um now, if the turtle back is still in place and the Bismarck is following an all or nothing armor scheme, then Bismarck will probably fare somewhat better in the, its final battle, if for no other reason than a lot of hits to, say, the upper belt and the fore and aft plating, which then had the shells initiated, will probably result in more of the over penetrations and shells going straight through now that's not going to save bismarck but it will at least hopefully um prevent quite the same level of uh, horrific damage to its upper superstructure and upper hull that it historically received which might allow more men to survive now if it goes with that uh, same scenario where uh, except now without the turtle back then things get a lot messier because the turtle back scheme did help to a reasonable degree in close quarters combat which is what most of Bismarck's final fight was in and to be perfectly honest having an all or nothing uh, scheme whether it's turtle back or not whether it's concentrated increasing belt thickness or distributed existing belt thickness probably doesn't change the overall outcome of the battle all that much because one of the critical opening parts of the battle was Rodney smashing Bismarck's fire control systems or primary fire control systems to pieces and that has nothing to do with the ship's hull armour protection system. Now where there could have been a slight change in Bismarck's favour would have been regardless of whether you're using turtle back or main deck if you do an all or nothing scheme where you are taking away all the extraneous plating you're not increasing the size of the main belt but you are distributing all the saved weight into increasing thickness of armor if then you also increase the thickness not just of the main belt but using some of that weight the thickness of the turrets specifically the turret facing if you really go walk to town on that you might get the turrets up to a thickness whereby they could resist the shot that again Rodney put out that knocked out Bismarck's forward armament and if you can do that then Bismarck's forward guns might stay in play a bit longer 
and therefore they might actually hit something, which therefore might, well, again, it's not going to save Bismarck, but it might make the battle a little less one-sided than it already was. So, yeah, in some circumstances, Bismarck could have fared slightly better, but outside of one specific case, it's not going to do much better, and even then it's still going to die. Now, what might change Bismarck's entire career when it comes to its armour scheme, if it had been fitted with all or nothing, is if a very specific type of armour scheme had been followed for the all or nothing compared to its original design, and that is if you go with the option of maintaining the existing belt thickness but lengthening and spreading that belt using up the weight of the previous upper belt and uh, the fore and aft plating and that is because the hit from Prince of Wales in the Battle of Denmark Strait that punctured the fuel tank in the bow and which was ultimately the thing that sent Bismarck home and set in motion all the events that we know of from history that was, I mean, it's not immediately forward of Tara Anton, but it's not too far forward. And if somebody had decided, well, actually, we're just going to have a longer belt, granted, you might be arguing, well, why is the belt being extended, given that uh, one of the principles of all or nothing is to protect the shortest possible space with maximum possible armour, thus forming a citadel, then, on the other hand, you could un argue that, well, the fuel sources of the ship are possibly a vital aspect. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that that particular interpretation of all or nothing has been followed, uh, the, the uniform thickness belt has just made, been made longer, there's a reasonable possibility that that belt may then either fully or partially resist the impact of the 14-inch shell, thus preserving the fuel tank and therefore Bismarck still having enough fuel to continue its voyage and not having quite the same level of flooding that it historically then ended up with may never actually then need to turn away for home and so it would probably follow a completely different course and thus history would look very very different because we don't know really what it would have done from then on. Michael asks, is it, I know you tend to focus on the 19th, 20th century, but I have a question for the high middle ages, so please indulge me. Well, I obviously am, so go on. Um, what do you think would have been the natural development of naval shipbuilding dash warfare if cannon were not introduced as a warship's main armament? So the, there's two ways that this could go down. Um, one is a literal interpretation, cannon are not introduced as a warship's main armament, but they're still there. Or perhaps a more interesting one of cannons just don't get mounted on ships. In the former case, you, well, you're looking at something that would probably continue to evolve from something along the lines of a Spanish galleon of the kind of Armada period, because that was kind of the epitome of the medieval concept of boarding but supplemented by gunfire um, and obviously earlier versions of that things like the Mary Rose, the Great Michael, the Henry Grassadier etc etc which we've already um, covered in other dry docks. Now in that particular case what you would see is a few heavy guns staying below but probably still staying, staying on siege mounts and gun crews not being particularly specialised because you effectively just load the guns once before the battle, run them out, blast a broadside into the enemy, and then try and board. So four castles, later obviously becoming forecastles, and after castles or stern castles would still be the main focus. They, they would probably become even more hilariously large, which would mean you'd probably see more incidents like the Vassa, um, or indeed possibly even the Mary Rose, and these would probably still become more and more equipped with cannon, but they would not be ship-to-ship -ship cannon. They would be small anti-personnel cannon for boarding and counter-boarding efforts. You also very likely would not see the main deck of a ship evolve as an open area 
from which to operate because one of the single largest causes of casualties, say when something like the Mary Rose sank, was the fact that what would later become the main deck area had a massive net uh, put over it specifically to stop boarders jumping down and into the ship. Um, and obviously if your main deck comes all the way up very close to the sides of the ship then such a net is relatively ineffective and instead you have the size of the ship coming up significantly higher than your last continuous deck and uh, so then people get, sort of get caught like flies in a web and then they can be shot or stabbed or speared etc at leisure so that particular development will probably hold off and you would see ships becoming more and more like mobile fortresses because that would be the only way for people to fight and, and as armor evolved then you'd probably see a lot of light guns and when i say light guns i mean things like swivel mounted pieces and such not so much handheld weapons but relatively powerful um small cannon but <laughs> so that that would be one line of possible development the other line of development which is if cannons just flat out aren't introduced onto ships either because cannons just don't find their way into Europe, which I guess means gunpowder doesn't, or for whatever esoteric reason, it's just not a thing to take them aboard ships for hundreds of years. Now, in those cases, you're going to see a similar evolution of ships becoming massive floating fortresses with huge, heavily fortified um, fore and aft castle areas. But I think what you'll then see is because the decks don't need to be strengthened to carry heavy guns um, you don't have to have um, ports in the hull, hull to fire guns from you will probably then see ships becoming somewhat lower in the water except for areas where you can't do that for reasons of survival so places where you have to operate substantially in the atlantic and north sea um, for instance, but in, say, areas like the Mediterranean, something more approaching a galleas with lots of sails, forecastle, stone castle, and for boarding, etc., but being a relatively low in the water vessel would probably predominate um, because there's no reason to have the high sides because you don't have the broadside guns. So uh, making your ship lower in the water and faster might allow you to manoeuvre around to... Uh, get around your enemy and get a favorable boarding action if possible the only downside of course being that if you lower your ship overall the height of your castles becomes less which gives your enemy a firepower advantage because they can shoot down onto you which might mean either absurdly large um, vessels in terms of height maybe even catamaran style ships or you might end up with those particular performance factors being ignored in favour of building ever higher and higher ships in a sort of a race to the heavens to try and get your borders to have the greatest height advantage over the enemy, which would in turn lead to some rather interesting engagements because when you would probably have these very high ships fighting each other, but then a smaller ship comes along, you may well have a height advantage to clear the enemy decks, but it may be very difficult for you to actually board the enemy because they'll be so far down that jumping from your ship to their ship is an invitation for a broken leg or worse <laughs> at which point hilariously enough you might see ships almost imitating siege engines in a way in that instead of having gun ports in your high-sided hulls you might in end up with boarding ramps in your high-sided hulls either so that you can board smaller ships safely or indeed so that these larger ships with their larger complements of men can actually utilise those complements of men, and uh, hauling your ships alongside might involve boarding actions at multiple different levels. So, yeah, that those would be some very, very interesting battles, effectively turning ships into large troop transports. Now, whether or not firearms as a whole are introduced in that scenario it brings a whole other raft of factors in because if firearms just aren't a thing and this is why 
cannon aren't on the ships. At some point, armor is going to outpace most hand uh, cranked or hand drawn projectile weapons in terms of resisting incoming fire, except for maybe effectively the not quite the reinvention of the ballista because you're not going to have torsion power. Um, you might, but they are complicated weapons. You might have kind of giant crossbows firing bolts that might be able to still punch a man off his feet and into the water through his armor, but those would be relatively few and relatively slow firing. Um, at which point having the ability to deploy greater numbers of men into melee would be very important. Or if it's just the cannon that aren't coming aboard and you might then have firearms, then might have very large heavy firing tops for arquebuses and such like to try and take out as many enemy troops as you can before you launch this this boarding fight it's, it's a very interesting bit of scenario to consider to be honest right on to patreon questions and mark persad asks why was the royal navy behind in fleet carrier bodies i guess he means hulls at the start of world war ii compared to japan and the usa well the simple answer is that they weren't really if you look at the hulls that were classified as fleet carriers that were in service for the various navies up until the start of world war ii in 1939 the royal navy is actually ahead um because they have glorious courageous furious eagle and arc royal for a total of five fleet carrier hulls they also have um, argus and hermes but those aren't really classified as fleet carriers at the time now if you pop over to the u.s navy they have lexington saratoga yorktown and enterprise for a total of four ranger is big enough but the u.s navy never seemed to use it as a fleet carrier they didn't really rate it so the u.s navy is four kind of maybe five which puts it at a slight disadvantage compared to the Royal Navy in terms of pure hull numbers. And, of course, uh, Langley at this point has been redeveloped, so um, absolute numbers favour the Royal Navy. Then on the Japanese side, you've got Akagi, Kaga, Soryu and Hiryu for a total of four. And then you've got Ryuho, which is, again, kind of like Ranger, uh, a light carrier that occasionally masquerades as a fleet carrier which again kind of puts it on the japanese navy at a slight numerical disadvantage for fleet carriers kind of both the u.s navy and japan have kind of four and a half the royal navy has five at least by the definitions of the time the japanese obviously also have hosho which like hermes is not classified as a fleet carrier at the time then you look at what they had building and I what they commissioned up to, let's say, the end of 1941 when the US gets involved. And during that period, the Japanese add Shikaku and Zuikaku as fleet carriers, as well as Zuiho and Shoho, which are light carriers. The Americans managed to put Wasp and Hornet into action, although... Wasp, again, kind of like Ranger, is not really a full-on fleet carrier, but for the sake of argument, it, it might as well be. The Royal Navy is able to put in Unicorn, which is an aircraft repair ship and light carrier. It's not really a full fleet carrier, but by the end of 41, they put Illustrious, Formidable, Victorious, and Indomitable into service, which actually means at the end of 1941, the Royal Navy has put more fleet carriers into service than either the US Navy or the Japanese Navy by a fair margin. Now, granted, uh, by the time you get to the end of 1941, you're looking at having lost both Glorious and Courageous um, relatively early on, and right at the end of 941, they also lose Arc Royal. So in absolute numbers, the Royal Navy is one down, but at this point, they're two and a half years into the second world war and in modern hull numbers as I say they've put an entire class of armored carrier into service now granted these hulls 
of the Royal Navy couldn't carry as many aircraft individually as many of their foreign rivals. I mean, Ark Royal was probably just as capable, but obviously Eagle and Glorious, Furious, Courageous, etc. Um, are not carrying vast numbers of aircraft as compared to something like Lexington, um, Enterprise, Akagi or Hiryu. But the reason for the, why the Royal Navy's fleet carriers have individually smaller aircraft wings is an entirely different question. Nick Boy 302 asks a tripart question. One, in 1918, the High Seas Fleet mutinied to save themselves from a losing war, yet as late as 1945, there were still German and Japanese sailors going to sea. Why didn't morale amongst the Axis navies collapse when it became blatantly obvious that the war was lost? Two, if you could interview one admiral from the Japanese, US and Royal Navies, regardless of whether they survived their respective engagements, which ones would you pick and what questions would you ask them? And three, during his 1919 review into Australia's naval defence, Admiral Jellicoe uh, recommended the creation of a Far Eastern Imperial fleet consisting of eight battleships, eight battlecruisers, 30 light cruisers, 40 destroyers, three flotilla leaders, two depot ships, 36 submarines, four submarine parent ships, four aircraft carriers, 12 fleet minesweepers, one large seagoing mine layer, two fleet repair ships, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Financed by Australia, the UK, and New Zealand, what do you think the implications would have been of su had such a massive fleet been built? Well, in regards to the morale aspect of things, there was some morale collapse in both navies in 1945 and indeed in the latter part of 1944 when it became fairly obvious that this was only ever going to end one way, even to the most uh, diehard of Nazi or Bushido fanboys. But at the same time, much as I hate to say it, death has a wonderful ability to focus the mind. Now, in 1918, the High Seas Fleet could not really do all that much to change anything. It couldn't really do all that much of other than swing around at anchor in port, and it had been doing that for quite a while. And boredom breeds frustration, which uh, in this particular case breeds revolution. They could have tried to sail out, but they knew that that one big operation or trying to sail out in small packets would just get them all killed, so they didn't do that, and that was pretty much it. Now, whilst morale had, as I said, in some cases, taken quite a bit of a hit in uh, the latter part of the Second World War, for the Kriegsmarine, there was still plenty to do, and there was still plenty of threat around. So you had bombing raids, you had the threat of mostly Russian submarines, some Allied submarines as well, because most of the Kriegsmarine that was left was operating in the um, Baltic area. And there were Russians coming in fairly large numbers, and most German personnel had concluded that, well, if the war is lost, the one thing we want to do is try and at least surrender to the Allies, because they might be slightly more merciful than the Russians, who had something of a understandable chip on their shoulder about the whole, you know, Operation Barbarossa thing, and uh, what the Nazis had done to the populace that they would occupied thereafter. And so the remaining elements of the Kriegsmarine spent a lot of the last few months of the war in operations either evacuating um, troops and civilians or supporting troops in shore bombardments etc and that kind of that mixture of a threat of death and the fact that they were actually doing something helped to keep their minds focused on things other than the war is lost and Russians are probably going to take over half or more of the country um, in the Japanese case it's partially similar in as much as that they again they were fighting the allies right up until the end and partially also cultural the whole death before dishonor thing etc um, which was fairly ingrained in various elements of the japanese armed forces so it's it's a mixture of cultural differences especially in the japanese case and also just the fact that 
they were still fighting and fighting quite hard all the way through up to the end of the war as much as they could whereas the high seas fleet as i said had basically spent the better part of a year or so swinging around pointlessly not doing an awful lot other than watching everything come around apart come apart around their ears which wasn't really good for morale and they hadn't been given anything to focus on to distract them from said inevitable collapse um also it was a in world war ii was a bit more drawn out the reverses that both germany and japan suffered played out gradually over two to three years which kind of gives the human mind a little bit of room to adjust to the idea that something rather awful is about to happen whereas for the germans although the situation was getting bad right up until operation michael collapsed there was still at least via propaganda some hope of victory and then for that to turn around in a matter of weeks to a few months from we might actually just about win this to uh yeah everything's gone to hell in a handbasket and uh we we are probably now going to lose this quite badly the human mind doesn't cope with changes on that kind of scale that quickly very well for the interview question i would for the japanese navy definitely want to interview admiral togo to get a better understanding of just what exactly the heck went down at tsushima but also as one of the only admirals to lead a kind of pre dreadnought era fleet into battle and then having uh, watched the rise of the dreadnoughts i think he would have a very unique perspective on that whole 1890 through about 1920-25 time period that definitely could use um, some more publicity because well obviously he didn't do that kind of retrospective at the time since no one knew quite how definitive an era that was going to be but also well sources translated into english from japanese are still relatively lacking both compared to the number that there originally were before the Japanese helpfully set fire to a bunch of them at the end of World War II. But even the ones that survived, quite often there's a lot of some material that has not been translated uh, from Japanese into English and thus is locked away behind a linguistic barrier for much of the Western world. Um, for instance, as was mentioned in, I believe, the video on the Zero, or it might have been elsewhere, the sort of revelations that Fushida's account of Midway was, um, shall we say, factually questionable were relatively groundbreaking when it came out in the Western world. But as far as the Japanese were concerned, that had pretty much been known for quite a while. But those particular discussions, uh, agreements and new th sources that had been translated just hadn't been shared with the English-speaking community. So, yeah, Admiral Togo, definite shoe for the Japanese position. For American admirals, I would choose Admiral Farragut for one very good reason. I challenge you to find anybody else that you could interview who reached the rank of Admiral who could give you full, detailed, blow-by-blow -blow accounts of military engagements in the classic age of sail because remember he served in the war of 1812 and can simultaneously give you accounts on full blow by blow accounts of battles in the age of steam and steel where he led part of the union navy during the american civil war that is one very unique set of experiences and uh well yeah that the, the number of questions that you could ask him about his his naval experience in that case would just be fantastic and for the british probably not a massive surprise that i'm going to interview admiral jellico uh, i've got to admit i was tempted to say bc but then i concluded a massive backhander whilst wearing one of my uh plate gauntlets probably doesn't technically count as an interview um, so yeah admiral jellico it is now, I do feel, I, as you probably already know, I do feel he was incredibly hard done by by the political shenanigans that Beatty tried to pull in the post Jutland environment. And being that Admiral Jellicoe was a relatively reserved man when it came to these kinds of things, he didn't say 
a massive amount, certainly compared to the level of uh, diatribe that BT put out. So I think it would be a the writing of a great wrong to get Admiral Jellico to be able to give a full and detailed account of his own views on the Grand Fleet, World War One, and the Battle of Jutland, but also whilst not quite having the same technological uh, advancement span as Admiral Farragut, he was still an active duty service officer in the latter part of the 19th century, so he would have seen the Royal Navy go from ironclad through pre-dreadnought to dreadnought to super dreadnought and into the Washington Naval Treaty era. So again, he would have had a very unique perspective on things beyond just Jutland. So, yep, he's def a definite shoe in for the British candidate. Now, as far as Admiral Jellicoe's plans for a Far Eastern Imperial fleet, <laughs> well, um, yeah, he, he was planning a Far Eastern fleet that basically matched the entire plans for the, of the Japanese Navy and was completely separate from the home fleet that the Royal Navy was going to keep in European waters to guard against uh, other people's interests in the Mediterranean, well, not even in the Mediterranean, in the North Sea and the Atlantic. The Mediterranean fleet was still going to exist as well. So, wow, that, that that's that's a, a fairly substantial Imperial Navy. Now, granted, uh, Australia and New Zealand were expected to pay for about 25% of this fleet, but the implications of that being built before the Washington Naval Treaty, the... The, the Japanese would have had some very, very interesting things to say about that. Um, I mean, there's no way that Australia and New Zealand could afford to pay for it continuously, which is pretty much what Admiral Jellicoe pointed out. But with if that level of investment had been made in producing eight post-World War One design battleships and eight post-World War One design battle cruisers, i.e. probably Admiral Class or Admiral Class successors, um, and something probably with 16 or 18 inch guns for the battleships, there's no way the Royal Navy would have wanted to get rid of those. Um, equally, there's very little chance that those ships would have fitted into the historical Washington Naval Treaty restrictions, which means that A, the gun caliber, well, the, yeah, the gun caliber and displacement limitations in the Washington Naval Treaty would be substantially higher than they were historically, which would probably lead to a larger number of Washington, so-called Washington cherry tree designs being completed as everyone tried to desperately rationalize and ration out who gets what and how to equalize the situation. Um, and, well, much as it plays very much up into the whole perfidious Albion thing, um, given that the Royal Navy would still have the fleet that it historically had for the Washington Naval Treaty, post-Washington, so the 13.5-inch ships, the 15-inch ships, etc., and probably if they'd gone for broke at this point, a bunch of new ships for themselves, given they probably want to keep those, there's an outside possibility that the British might try and come up with some sneaky way to, to sort of get a bunch of cash to Australia and New Zealand under the table in some manner, um, maybe by hilariously preferential trade regulations or something, in an effort to say, no, 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 Australia and New Zealand are... The Anzac Navy is entirely its own thing, and um, therefore they should have an equal but separate seat at this table. I, I can't see that going down very well with America or Japan, um, or anyone who's not Britain, to be honest, but exactly how that would shake out diplomatically, I don't even want to think. But if they had somehow pulled that off, then the Anzac fleet... Welcome to the rank of great powers, um, which would make for a rather interesting setup, wouldn't it? If imagine if the UN Security Council was um, was made up of instead of instead of the historical powers, it ended up being made up of the probably what France's seat, I imagine, 
would be taken by the Australians and New Zealanders, maybe on a rotating basis, maybe on a joint basis. Now, wouldn't that be an interesting world to live in? And so we wrap up with the channel admin. Now there is a small update for the America trip. That is specifically that, although I said I was probably going to have to cancel and claim everything back, it looks like there may be opportunities that uh, to rebook. A lot of the airlines, in fact, every airline except for JetBlue so far, have asked me if I would like to rebook my flights. So I'm currently consulting my calendar and schedule to see if I can rebook the flights. They've offered quite a wide-ranging rebooking option. So I'm thinking now, based on feedback with a few of the a few of you who have um, asked about that and advised on various availability dates, etc. I'm thinking of rebooking the whole thing for late September dash early October. I'm not sure whether it's going to be the week that overlaps the two months and then the week after or the last full week in September and then uh, the, the sort of the week that overlaps the two, one of the two. Um, but anyway, I'm going to make a decision on that over the weekend and start reallocating flights. Then once that's done, I have to talk to the hotel industry, assuming that they're still alive or at least at work, and try and rebook the hotels as well. And hopefully then that will be minimal disruption and we can all get everything sorted for uh, a, a re-revised trip, pretty much to the same schedule but just different dates, uh, towards the end of the year. And uh, I'll keep you updated with that as the situation develops. And just to set everyone's minds at ease, I am now, for the day job, working from home. Um, so, well, I get my commute time back, which is nice. Um, the The situation in the UK is not brilliant. It's not awful either. Um, supermarkets have imposed a series of restrictions as to the total amount of any one item you can buy which seems to be stabilizing the supply situation somewhat uh, don't worry i am perfectly well stocked with toilet paper so i can become the toilet paper king in the inevitable wasteland <laughs> and of course who knew being a medieval reenactor means uh, i'm not too afraid of looters so we should hopefully all get through this um everyone obviously keep yourselves safe and secure as best you can during this time and I will probably be running a few live streams to help alleviate the boredom for everybody in the upcoming weeks. I know I've got a an upcoming Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts live stream that may or may not have occurred by the time this dry, dry dock goes live and uh, we'll see what else we can do. Anyway with that said thank you very much for listening and see you again in another video.